through my book, I keep I, uh, asking the question of what does innovation actually mean to this marginalized majority, this global poor? And it comes at a time where you know there's a lot of enthusiasm about this demographic, right? Uh, in fact, between India and China alone, they make up majority of the internet users in the world. And you know that's just 50 percent as in India and 70 percent something in China. So that, that means there's a room for enormous growth, right? Which makes markets very excited. Um, of course, you know this is the mobile phone is it has been a game changer. And I hate using that word because we love the disruption, game changer, everything's a game changer. But it, it, we have to give them due credit because unlike the prior technologies of computers and laptops, you know, for a variety of reasons from cost, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, cost intensiveness, uh, uh, cumbersomeness of travel, you know, it wasn't scalable in multiple ways and definitely did not infuse uh, themselves in the lives of people, right? Whereas the mobile phone, of course, has and become extensions of people's lives. And also, it's not just these devices and their diverse creative data plans, but it's the very, um, the very new sort of innovations and breakthroughs like the likes of Geo, where Geo uh, in India, which is a private sector uh, initiative, is now offering, of course, in the last few years, 4G networks at ridiculously cheap prices. We're talking about 20 cents per GB compared to say 8 euros in Europe and 15 to 17 dollars in the US, right? That's a game changer for sure. So when you have these kind of initiatives, there is the smell of profit and promise to companies that this is the untapped gold mine that needs to be explored. Hence those are the phrase of you know, data is the new oil, and so it's not a coincidence that Google set up its next billion users lab as of last year and has been busily promoting itself in its altruistic mission of inclusiveness as well as, of course, uh, stock markets. You can see that NBU markets have become a thing, where, you know, very reminiscent of the emerging markets of the 1990s where investors were very scared of investing in developing countries but were very enthusiastic about emerging markets. So now we have the you know NBU markets, shall we say, right? Um, but the question is, who are these next billion users? They are substantively young. We are talking about 36 percent of the population. They are, for the most part, you know, outside the West. We're talking about 85 percent, and they are low income, but upwardly mobile and absolutely enthusiastic about these technologies. Um, you know, as you can see that, especially in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, there is a huge uptake in growth in terms of young populations, whereas it is very relatively subsiding in many parts like Europe and the US, right? Um, they, one billion of them live in informal, sometimes illicit and even illegal settlements such as the slums or favelas or townships as you call it, right? And that's going to double in 2030 for a host of reasons. We can talk about you know, like migration, internal migration, external migration, you know, uh, poverty, jobs, and growing global inequality, and the likes. But the fact remains is majority of these next billion users are born criminal by default, right? When they reside in these, and they are subjected to different parallel forms of government, which is well worth keeping in mind when we're talking about regulation and privacy and whose rules apply, right? Um, a disturbing report by Intel in 2018 came out that actually the gender divide is also growing, in particularly in terms of you know, mobile uptake, say in sub-Saharan Africa, can go as high as 43%. And you know, this is not about affordability. I was just reading a, a last year's KPMG report in India where they focus primarily on gender pay gap in India, and it's all about the pricing aspect. That means that women don't have the equipment to be able to buy into these technologies all the time. But there's another dimension my book covers is that they're choosing not to, right? And that's because of the growing misogyny online, uh, the sort of revenge porn, the kind of doctrine deep fakes that are used as blackmail for their reputation, and a variety of other host of factors which is not creating a very safe environment for women, and thereby they are choosing not to be online. That's obviously a big problem. 
And one of the points I emphasize most in my book is the fact that the internet is the poor person's leisure of economy. And that is undoubtedly the case because, you know, if you look at the decades of evidence over, you know, and I'm sure a number of you have also experienced it in the field work, is that why are people so drawn to these technologies? And it's not because farmers want to check, you know, crop prices, women are dying to check healthcare information, you know, children want to so badly learn math, right? It's, for the most part, gaming, pornography, social networking sites, romancing. Also, just the young people, they want to self-actualize, you know, discover themselves, uh, you know, share jokes. It's all these what we call non-instrumental users. And in fact, while aid agencies continue to dictate these agendas based on socioeconomic outcomes, so you have these enormous sort of uh, list of metrics on which it determines the success and failure of a project, you know, a lot of it is, a lot of it is, uh, left out, which is the bulk of data usage in particular non-instrumental use. Whereas if you look at the private sector, look at what GEO has done. While aid agencies have, for the most part, refused to look at it, and for reasons which are constrained based on funding, right, measures. You can't tell, you know, uh, convince a donor that, hey, porn is good for development, because guess what, if the users used it mainly for porn, it doesn't really help you get the next round of funding. Whereas uh, private sector doesn't really have those problems, and so what does GEO do? Is it just looks at what the data is telling them, right? And how do they market themselves? They looked at what majority of uh, areas that the data was going into with the four aspects, and they call it the ABC principle, which is astrology, Bollywood, cricket, and devotion. So it is fascinating that they were able to give that you leverage and you know this and we can speak again much more there's a history about this sort of leisure divide this idea that for the masses it is actually a moral panic when they are indulging themselves in leisure because after all should they not be much more utility driven whereas of course what is our goal for the internet we want to enhance our well-being we want to immerse ourselves in leisure because after all isn't that what our fulfillment is about so there's been, it goes back to centuries about the sort of a leisure mentality of the man of leisure, woman leisure of the 17th century. In fact, you inculcate these sort of virtues of the elites, but of course the masses really need to like work, right? I mean, you know, it's a, the whole saying of like the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Um, now there's a legacy, so now what do we hear? We hear, this, uh, I'm sure many of you are subjected to the whole AI for good, and there's this whole momentum and numerous conferences. It's like the new buzz theme. It's not enough, of course, to say technology for good. Now we say AI for good, right? And it is very strong a pull into that direction. But, uh, you know, before we get carried away into this, you know, as if there's a new next thing, I want to remind and spend the rest of this talk talking about the legacy of this tech for good because there is a formula. And I'd like to talk about that formula. There's a template for doing good. And doing good is a very sort of like a colonial rubric that was adopted by the Washington Consensus, which is very much, look, I know what you need. Whether it is a colonial, I know what the natives need, to I know what these developing countries need. And so let's focus on needs and not wants, not demands. And so that template, if you look at it closely and sort of demystify it, then you may be just able to sort of escape that trap yet again, because it keeps getting reproduced with every novel technology, right? Every new innovation. So novelty is good. This idea of virtuousness, right? That novelty must be good after all, it's new, right? And, you know, of course, so what is a popular thing when you think about the next billion users is bottom-up innovation. And one of those buzz terms that have been around for a while in development circles for more than a decade, it emerged from the business circle, the Jugal innovation, one many, like it was on the New York Times bestseller, you know, uh, frugal innovation, and this idea that we need to transform our mindset, they're not beneficiaries, they're consumers, and we need, we need to see them as experts of their poverty. They are, the scarcity is breeding grounds of innovation. So it's almost like romanticizing scarcity, right? And this idea that these people are born entrepreneurs because after all, in such scarcity, they have to innovate. 
And so low cost, simple, flexible, you know, this is what is the middle class is missing out. And, uh, and indeed that is true. If we look around, you know, there's a lot of interesting tinkering going on. You know, as you can see, a lot of, you know, the jugarding is a term in India for improvisation. But this sort of, sort of language we see in China, Brazil, it says improvisational activities amongst the poor is a universal phenomenon. It, you know, and it just happens that the Indian guys wrote this business book, so it became Jugal innovation, right? But um, the fact is that the hacking is what, you know, is another term for it, has a sort of, like, you know, geek kind of uh, connotation in Silicon Valley, right? You're hacking the code, you're hacking uh, poverty. MIT comes and brings all these graduate students and let's hack poverty marathons, right? And uh, yet when we look at it on a ground level in developing countries, really hacking is like just a way of survival. So we are sort of like romanticizing and calling it entrepreneurship and more importantly, it can be very dangerous. So when people sort of hack their way to for public transport, meaning to navigate the insane traffic jams, right, and have three kids and sort of improvise a chair for their fourth kid, it's extraordinarily dangerous and is a huge safety hazard. And that is also a statistic. Like if you look at a number of developing countries, have very high uh, accident rates, right? Uh, so this is not something that you can look at and celebrate and then institutionalize as an innovation from below. Um, a lot of things, diluting milk, putting weights under so you can get more money. All that is also entrepreneurship for survival. So we need to sort of, you know, separate this notion of good and novelty so we can have a more honest conversation. Um, also when we sort of move away the need for doing good and novelty and separate and not see them as synonymous or naturally, you know, intrinsically tied to one another, then we can have a more honest conversation as, actually could ask the question, okay, so what's going on on the internet? What are these young people doing? What are the next million users doing? And what are the kinds of structures out there that is sort of enabling them or disabling them? And when you start to look at it, it is fascinating. So uh, as we know that you know the internet is not a product, right? It is an ongoing process and it's constantly shaped by the people who use it. So it is also sort of a critical public resource. So, it, and I, I literally, when I say it's public, even when it's run by private sector companies, they are still accountable to a public because when they move, because then there's a pushback, so we cannot see it as public or private. They are sort of enmeshed in ways that we need to un untangle. But it doesn't help for us to see them as separate, right? Uh, but uh, going back to what is actually going on on the internet is, for example, just social networking sites. We can talk about the novelty of how, say, Facebook has been used, and you can say, well, even though less than four percent of you know friends um, of uh, people in the West are strangers, if you look at the research in emerging economies, developing countries, it can be half, half or even two thirds. And this notion of friending strangers has been uh, has come up with a lot of interesting research from uh, why they do what they do. In fact, a BBC report signified that while you know there are many people in the West, we're talking about uh, only say 30, I mean majority of them say 70 percent uh, didn't see themselves as global citizens and were very sort of nationalistic. More than 70 or 80 percent in developing countries saw themselves as global citizens even though they probably never leave their context. And so there's a sort of, you need to see them as aspirational users. And this friending of strangers enables that. They connect with people from all over the world. They have, for the first time, girlfriends and boyfriends. Even though they've never met them, they will have their breakups, they feel like grown up, they feel more mature. So they, and this is, all has very tangible benefits because then they feel like they're prepared to then have an arranged marriage, right? Which is the majority of these young people who will actually go into that. Uh, so, but on the other hand, we also have to look at the rise of internet romance camps, which is a multi-million dollar industry, and it has an entire apparatus, which is also leveraging on 
the friendly of strangers practice. So even that becomes, so it is very unuseful to talk about goodness because then we can't have this conversation as a starting point. We need to see the kind of affordances and the constraints and the directionalities that these behaviors are going into. And we need to make sure that we are supporting factors which are enabling and sort of deterring or creating thoughtful regulation to protect them. And technology companies need to be part of that, right? Um, then look at Netflix, right? A lot of people call Netflix a major disruptor, right? As just a lot of these companies like uh, Spotify, etc., they've like really broken the internet of the past, right? But actually, when uh, you look at it closely, you see Spotify actually worked very closely with music industries, and actually for the first time, thanks to them, gave them life again. And in fact, music industries and labor started to make money again. Right? So a lot of it is not as novel as you'd like to see. And what's more crazy is the hypocrisy in this, that if you look at Airbnb and all these new platform companies, they have disrupted and done a lot of illegal work, right? Like Uber, etc. But it's celebrated in Silicon Valley is, you know, yeah, you, you, that's how you innovate. You break existing arrangements. You break a lot because you know what? That's how new things develop. And then say sorry later. But you know what, by the time it comes down to it, the users have fallen in love with it, and that's how you change society. And you're able to question the media empires. But that seems to have uh, not the same impact or same kind of uh, ideology when we apply to developing countries, because if you look at the literature, all the people in the global south are deviants, are criminals. In fact, they even been uh, equated as terrorists for you know pirating uh, you know Bollywood and Tollywood and Nollywood, you know, and so on and so forth. So, and this kind of hypocrisy continues till today. Is the deviants out there and the entrepreneurs in the West, right? And if we are and if you take Netflix as a model, and now it's uh, entered India and a number of other places is saying, look, this disruption at last is coming to places like India. But actually it's not. It is an elite consumption. Because the price of Netflix is, you know, five, six times far, like more than a cable TV, which is like offers 400 channels in India. Unlike, say, in the American counterpart, where they like the cable doesn't give you much, you know, and doesn't really offer that kind of uh, consumer, uh, doesn't satisfy the consumer needs. And last but not least, say, look at Pornhub, right? Uh, of course, the panic has, is constantly there amongst governments, amongst, you know, it, it's, it's like dominates the media headlines. The, the, you know, mobile is a Satan in the palm, you know, and pornography is killing our youth's mindset. And yeah, it, it's like the, the more panic and what's going to happen to our young people. But there's also another side to it. Porn has been the first step in, the, in terms of mobile uptake. If you have to attribute one single sort of behavior for sort of you know mobile engagement and sustenance, it has been pornography. So should we say porn for good? You know, and I mean, look, I understand the concerns. I'm not saying that oh, that's how you know young people should be learning about sex, but we don't give them any other alternative. Growing up in India, we never had any sex education in school. And that was then, and it still goes on. You don't talk about sex in school. Parents don't talk about sex. How did I learn about porn it was through some random Playboy magazine from a bad girl in school. And I somehow assumed kissing would lead to pregnancy, right? And that, I was the educator one, right? So when you don't talk about sex in any way, and you make something which is deeply natural as something which is extraordinarily deviant, and you have a site which actually, you know, tells you that this is how things are done. Of course, they're going to gravitate, right? And I saw India just ban like something like 700 like sites of pornography on WhatsApp. I know it's geo platform, but you know they've been like within a day they all came back online. I mean, it's not going to go. It's the oldest industry in the world. We just need to know that okay, this exists. These needs to discover our sexuality, our sexual needs exist. Can we create alternative spaces, not just online, but can in media, can we create a much more acceptable paradigm for these young people to naturalize it more, to make it into healthy practice? Because we are failing these young, uh, youngsters when that is the main uh, draw to the internet. And novelty is exceptional. 
right? And indeed, it is a myth, right? This, and uh, I agree with Leo Lee saying that in China, we are not in a shortage of makers. We actually have makers all around us, the makers who build our infrastructures, repair our phones, build our homes. China has so many makers, we just don't have a mechanism to identify them. We don't see them. And that is ex uh, absolutely true, is that, you know, innovation has, is around us, across us, that's how we make do, and particularly amongst low-income communities. Because people, you know, think, look at that. They're high-risk markets. They've been ignored by the market because they're not worth it. Banking industries, name it, any of these industries have ignored them, as well as governments, because often they live in illegal settlements, so they don't actually count. So a lot of uh, people who are refugees don't have voting rights. So the vast number of people actually have been excluded. So of course they have to innovate if they have to satisfy their needs, right? Second is emphasis on product or process. There's this enormous obsession about looking at innovation as technology products. But actually it really, for it to succeed or fail, we need to look at the process behind it. Amazon is not Amazon because of its product per se, but the mechanisms of how it delivers, the, the whole back infrastructure which we don't talk about. So look at like again the flip card which is the equivalent of the Amazon in India is you know for it to have been successful it had to learn from one of the oldest delivery systems in Mumbai which is called the Dhabawala system which is basically a tiffin carrier system which has been going on for hundreds of years in Mumbai by these case, sort of organized networks and now it will become a Harvard case study right because with no technology these guys, 5,000 Havawalas, deliver 130,000 lunch boxes, 260,000 transactions in six hours per day, right? Which means that they have 30 seconds per pickup, 40 seconds to load on a train, 20 seconds to pick it up from the person's house. Imagine that, right? And they, the way in which they've organized themselves in small clusters is what has been the success of the Stephenwalas. And that has been a very closely watched model for Flipkart to do well and others, e-commerce, right? Now, also this brings to life a very important conversation about the sort of automation of human beings, right? The sort of the moral conundrum. We are sort of, you know, giving Amazon all this like, you know, uh, pressure on how can it treat its laborers in such an inhumane way, in the way they're automating human beings, right? They need to deliver it, and I'm sure you guys are exposed to the amount of pressure Amazon is putting on its laborers, and increasing these extraordinarily inhumane conditions. However, this is not new, based on new technology platform. It's happening, I mean, if you look at the 30 seconds, 40 seconds, people are celebrating it in the case study. I actually, when I read it, I thought, this is extraordinarily inhumane. So what the, these people are doing is based on no room. They don't have lunch. During lunchtime, this is happening. So these guys function with no food, right? During that time, they cannot miss a, miss a beat. Because if they miss a beat, they are going to let down a very complex system and they're going to be out of a job. So there is a, this is an inhumane. That means this kind of practice has been going on for a long time. We somehow don't pay due course to it. Emphasis on product or process, another great example is FinTech. Again, people are so obsessed about the technology itself. It's not about the technology. If you really want to understand how FinTech is going to succeed or fail, or what are the trade-offs where people are panic panicking about privacy or a variety of other issues, we need to ask ourselves what is really what is the roots behind this? Remittances. You know, and alternatives of how banks have been extraordinarily exploitative, right? The current institutional regimes of banking systems, uh, you know, charge them ridiculous amounts to send money back home. And remittances have been one of the single most powerful ways in which poverty has been eradicated around the world. And so, if anything, banks have made it, in, uh, like, have been in spite of banks, shall we say, that poverty has been uplifted. And here, fintech comes around. So, we have to, when we talk about fintech, and we talk about, you know, is this a good technology or bad? We need to put in place a larger spectrum of let's compare to what are the alternatives these people have. And we can, just for the sake of time, I won't go into all the other areas, but identity is another very important thing. There's a lot of critique about biometric identity. And here's a very good example. Look at the date, August 12, 2019. 
Jay Stanley, a senior policy analyst from ACLU, what does he release an article on? Is he says, say no to the cashless future and to the cashless store. Now keep in mind, right, and we know this, is that fintech in China has been attributed to being the single most powerful mechanism to bring the most number of people out of poverty in the shortest amount of time historically. Because why? It was able to give small loans to these people built on, you know, reputational identities because, of course, you're coming from a history where you don't have assets, you're not bank worthy, you are continuing to be unbanked. So when you have such a massive problem, you have to be creative. And it's, innovation is not the prerogative of just the bottom up. It is also state-driven innovation. This is definitely a state-driven innovation. But if you have that mind, mindset, you can see how divergent the West is going to go from, you know, because they're all speaking about the poor. And they're speaking about how it's bad for the poor, right? But on what evidence? I mean, so I would, I would even push, and they also, what is even more disturbing is this whole article was based on credit cards. So, I mean, credit cards. So they talk about credit card fees. Like, did they just miss the last decade, right? And this is a, it, you know, the, when we speak on behalf of the poor, the undocumented, well, if you asked a regular undocumented person, say, so you must be very happy to not be documented because your privacy will be invaded. I would like to, you know, listen closely to the answer because actually it is very empowering to at last be identified so you can say access welfare, you can access facilities, you can make a case for yourself, you can legally fight, you can be somebody. When you're invisible, then anything can happen to you. You are even more extraordinarily vulnerable. Again, privacy is not an absolute, it's a trade-off. And so look at the reasons why what was given. Privacy is invasive, and that way these platforms are middlemen. Assuming these middlemen are actually, you know, going to be worse than the current situation, right? Uh, and it's bad for low-income communities because of IDs, because the fees go to the customers. But in comparison to what, right? Because banks don't even look at them in the first place. So, and not to forget, of course, we're not talking about credit card anymore. Right? It's such an old-fashioned way of resolving this banking crisis of the unbanked is what, 4 billion people plus. The credit card, is, nobody's saying credit card is an answer except in places in the West. So we are really, they are way behind. And so it is not a surprise they're panicking about FinTech because I don't think they have even reached the level of credit card acceptance. Right? Uh, radical disruption versus incremental re reform as a third point is so I, I was hired by UNESCO to do this, uh, you know, assessment of tech innovation for in developing countries, you know, and what are like, these price-based institutions? Who are they funding? You know, like based on which are the applications of innovators out there, and who gets the money, right? What are the coolest innovations? And I talked to hundreds of people at these events, and one the typical conversation was each one was trying to outdo the other and say. This is going to be a school within an app. It's like all you need is this one app. And then it just went higher and higher and became more and more exaggerated because you had to claim these massive impacts and you could not be uh, you know, dependent on uh, human intermediaries because then you wouldn't be testable. Because the way in which you won these prizes was based on an evaluation metric that was already designed for, for measuring whether something is good or bad in innovation. So what happened was, of course, there were so many innovation or so many applications out there, but they all were the diverse products of the same kind. They were all actually replicated in the same way because they all left out any kind of human intermediary, and they all were super exaggerated in terms of the ecology system of everything, right? And somehow people will intuitively fix it because they're hackers at heart something like that, very naive and completely without empirical evidence. Um, and in fact, people so believe that, there is so, some of the Silicon Valley have really what they can call drank their own Kool-Aid, that bill, millions of dollars, 50 million went to the venture capitalist, uh, um, uh, I forget his name, Max Ventilla actually, uh, to set up all school, Gates Foundation, Zuckerberg Foundation, name it. All the Silicon Valley people said, you know what, let's live our dream, we're going to create the all school. 
in Silicon Valley and we're going to export this model where kids can not have curriculum, they will have playlists and they will be their own teachers and teachers are just going to be data crunchers. And so they came, there was bean bags, kids just rest around, they follow their playlists. Three years later, parents were protesting, these very wealthy parents who put, you know, 40,000 per year and behind the sort of you know, 50 to 70 million, and they're like, well, it was an abysmal failure, and parents are like, you just used up kids as guinea pigs to build this application because my kids didn't learn anything. And it was so enormously mad, and we're talking about in a, one of the wealthiest parts of the U.S., right? And, it, and yet, after this major failure, Ventura was like, well, that's what innovation is, you know, but I'm going to like sell the software to all the schools in the U.S particularly the poor communities, because hey, guess what? They really needed it even more. Sure, because your kids really benefited, right? Um, so radical disruption was an incremental reform. This is so old. So what does Thomas Edison say about the motion picture? Of course it's gonna get rid of books, right? Or Negroponte, his brilliant idea, which in 2011 got a standing ovation, is what did he propose about tablets? Hey, I'm gonna drop tablets from the sky in the Kalahari Desert and kids are going to run. Now, if you heard this without knowing it's Nicholas Negroponte, you would think this is a lunatic on a street who needs to be just be, you know, put in like some institutional home, right? But no, he got a standing ovation at the Silicon Valley Summit. And not to forget, he compared it to the Coke bottle falling out of the sky, the movie, which was basically, if you remember the plot line, it was the Coke bottle fell, the community, the tribal community got so initially excited about it, but soon it created so much of tension that they had to get rid of that Coke bottle, right? Somehow you didn't watch the end of the movie, I think. And then you have the a Larry Page talking about how AI will you know, be the ultimate fixer of everything on the web, when we know, as you know, about algorithms of oppression, is that Google is not the fixer. It is really sometimes reproducing biases, reproducing prejudices, our ways of thinking. It gives us suggestions which are steering us into bad curricular choices. We can't have Google as our instructor. What about the OLPC? It has been an absolute failure over a decade of evidence. Every single country that invested millions, in total, we're talking about a billion dollar project was abysmal failure after 10 years. And who sits on today's innovation board at the X Prize? Nicholas Negroponte, of course. Because he's going to guide us in the next decade of failure, right? Because failure is a pathway to innovation. And then, of course, when we talk about books, is like as if that motion picture will kill books. Well, schools are even banning mobile phones in schools because it's realizing it's not very conducive for learning. So, you know, the fourth point is autonomous versus assistive tech. My, so it's almost like a conclusive uh, point of my previous uh, aspects is that you cannot see these like a school within an app as autonomous. We need to move away from that language itself because when I say automation or autonomous tech, I immediately am not thinking about the people involved. When I say assistive tech, I have to then say who is it assisting? Who is assisting for what purposes? I ask more meaningful questions, which is what all technology, even when something is automated, there's an entire human infrastructure around it, which is making it automated, or even simulating as if it is automated, right? And yet we hear people like this, like Kefu Lee says, when asked by the European you know, uh, innovators and all so hungry for him to lead in the pathway, saying, Tell us the secrets of the future of innovation. He said, I'll give you a suggestion, Europe. If you want to experiment, find some truly underdeveloped country where there's nothing and try your idea there. This notion that a community in a developing country is this blank slate, there's nothing in there. Like these communities are just waiting, sort of guinea pig saying, please help me because we are just waiting for rescuing, is absolutely condescending. Sugata Mitra, who continues astonishingly to be a tech evangelist in this world, says, we are describing a part of our planet where children with nothing other than a street side computer are able to answer tests on their own. They have no teachers or educational support from their parents or anyone else in the community. If you look closely at the research, that is absolutely untrue. 
And I have literally been at the same sites that he was in, and I've seen these projects fail astronomically. I have also done ethnographic work, except I have a different agenda. I had no stake. His company, NIT, was very much webbed into selling the technology to the Indian government. So I believe there's a conflict of interest there, right? So, you know, talking about the human aspect of automation, we are also, I, I hope people are watching a documentary like The Cleaners, which is, gives you a visceral feeling of what it's like to be a human moderator in the Philippines or in Vietnam or in any of these massive, you know, uh, uh, offices which, where people are cleaning up the internet for us to consume in a safe way. And we think it's bots, we think it's like smart technology, we think it's AI, but a lot of that is actually moderated by hundreds of thousands of human beings whose only job is hyper-specialized watching just beheading videos all day for 14 hours and gets into post-traumatic stress disorder and then they actually have high turnovers because they are so screwed up. And we, they cannot talk about it because they have to sign all these legal contracts because they're supposed to be invisible. Facebook's supposed to have corrected the algorithm. This is all about AI, and it's not. And last point is about the silence and trade-offs. It is, you know, we talk about, um, you know, a number of sort of AI aspects, like, for example, hey, what about uh, releasing drones to catch poachers in Africa so we could hold them accountable. So let's put millions of dollars into drone technology and AI will be good for that community. So when we come up with a solutionism-centric approach, we will start with the drone as a technology, then we look at the problem and say, okay, where does this technology fit into this problem? If we come up with a problem-centric approach, we'll start to say, why are poachers poaching? Why are they doing what they're doing? Do they not care about the environments? Or what else is at stake? Why are these communities continuing to ravage their own environments? What is going on? What are the economic drives that are pushing them towards this? Who are the consumers behind this? Why do people want this? You're asking meaningful questions. And then you have to ask, that is it worth like the millions of euros are you spending it on supporting these communities in building actual labor, meaningful jobs, or just selling more drones to a community, which is basically enhancing their stress, but they'll continue doing what they're doing. It just makes them live in a more dangerous world, right? Opportunity, there are always opportunity costs. You know, if we look at the OLPC, the one laptop, uh, one laptop per child, it's a hundred dollar laptop, right? That's what was proposed in the decades ago that look, it's such a cheap laptop. But in many parts of Africa, $100 was the budget, annual budget for a child for the entire year. So what countries, when they adopted that, was doing was they played Russian roulette on these kids' education. They said, instead of funding your school or teachers or books or anything, we're going to give it to OLPC. And when they made that decision, that was a trade-off which was happening, right? And so we, are, we need to be very responsible for this because there are trade-offs. I noticed in the SDGs, um, 250 million has been allocated for evaluation of uh, all the projects, right? Which is fine and they're going to use AI, but at what cost? Would, that's the kind of conversation we need to have. Concluding remarks here are, we do need to shift our focus from needs to wants. Let's start, you know, this, what is crazy is the Maslow Pyramid, which has been debunked in the 60s. I mean, people don't function in the sort of way of, yes, I need to satisfy my physiological safety, social, and then go into self-actualizing. Actually, people, low-income communities, survive because it's their co essential coping strategy. People wonder why are they spending disproportionate amounts of their income. In fact, they spend more per percentage of their income on these data plans than we do, okay? And you're like, what's wrong with them? They're giving up their food, they're giving up lunch. Firstly, they're teenagers, right? Their priorities are different. They're like, if they can like chat up this girl in Brazil for a little longer, it's so much worth, like, they can skip that meal, right? 
this idea that it's so condescending that we our needs driven was what we need to ask them what is it they need what what is they want desire it's about aspiration what is it that they're seeking what is it they want to self fulfill right actualize and then let's see if that can guide us in shaping what kind of needs need to be fulfilled recenter to the mundane the everyday the incremental because guess what innovation is if we are to get on the bandwagon that it, and which it is true is innovation is all around us it's incremental it's not sexy it's in the small little uh, you know aspects that happen on an everyday level women have been innovating for the longest of time you don't hear them as innovators they're just you know improvisers of life so it's also there's a sort of gender dimension men innovate women make do right but if you look closely at what these communities do to survive of course you have to innovate all the time for yourself for your children for your community and so we need to look at the mundane we need to sort of bring it down to an early level we need to also shift our mindset of this you know the west has constantly had this sort of notion of well there's trickle down tech we innovate we come up with the best technologies and then we disseminate to the rest right and they'll catch up which is like i said they are at this point in many ways way behind but they still have this mindset and it, it continues getting infused it's not a surprise that 85% of the ai for good initiatives have been launched by silicon valley and there's not much uptake in among governments municipalities talk to the average person they're like oh yeah it's like this maybe they'll partner with them because they want you know something more from them or that there's a sort of larger geopolitics in question but they're not really believing this ai for good right and there's also this deep condescension because they want to talk about fintech china is leading the way by leaps and bounds but that's not addressed in these reports if you talk about smart city singapore is doing a lot of interesting work but it's not looked upon in ways that can be learned you know can be disseminated um and so you know a, a battery life right it came a lot from the push from developing countries because you couldn't just charge your phone and you couldn't take it for granted that you could just plug in and get electricity any time so you know there's a, if this kind of thinking continues they are going to continue to believe credit card is the future as we can see and how that is also we need to go back to cash as it seems to be the best way to protect poor people right and uh, we're not going to learn much but even more importantly is developing I, mean, i think people practitioners policy makers need to get more confidence in developing countries to believe that it's not the west who has all the solution that it is happening here and it is happening very much in front of you and you need to recognize it put your you know box behind it and start to see how to support it and enable it in ways that are genuinely indigenous and last but not least is the global turnaround i was listening to a podcast a couple of months ago of with mike pence saying that we are in an information war this is what he said he said we the west eh, like are really against the east in this information war and so you really need to come in terms of in alignment with what your values are he actually used the us versus them paradigm in a way which is absolutely dangerous to evoke because it's this whole divisions of developing and developed countries or global south and north is doesn't make sense today and probably never has because look at a typical you know map out the ecology of technological uh, infrastructures right you have uh, you know uh, the material being mined for batteries in chile you have material the sort of the conflict materials being mined in congo and you need to talk about labor right in um that's being used for the cell phone materials you have netherlands as a great way to sort of offshore set up your offshore accounts to you know channel a lot of uh, financing so you don't pay taxes you have you know a lot of uh, back offices like for human moderations in the philippines and vietnam and you have a lot of fa- you know gadgets being made in china or you know, and you start to break it down and you realize these technology enterprises or products and not american products chinese products indian products china is investing heavily in innovations in india right a good stake of it you even start to look at who are the shareholders right who are the also aspirational models and then really doesn't make sense it really helps to be 
move approach this as a global uh, by default. And then we can have an honest conversation about who is responsible for what, and we need to come up with global ethical regulations about human labor you know, being used to make products cheap, affordable, fast and fast. All this is happening at some cost, and we need to recognize what cost, right? So I will stop here, and yeah, I'm looking forward to a discussion here. Um, and any questions? Thank you.